just to, like to invite the public into the gallery. Um, members were content to start the meeting in open session. Um, everyone's welcome back from the summer recess. What was that? Um, and I, and I, I hate using the word recess because it's never a recess for us. We, we still go on working, but um, you're very welcome back nevertheless. Today we have quite a lengthy bit of business to get through, so um, just a wee bit of housekeeping in relation to your mobile phones and electronic devices, with the exception of your tablets. Um, uh, obviously, as rehearsed before, it's not sufficient to have them on standby as they do interfere with hands art. <laughs> but, um, Members, there's three issues to raise before we go into the main items. Obviously, the lengthy agenda, um, there's a lot on today, and since it's our first meeting since the June recess, we have a heavy workload. So if anyone has to maybe you know leave early, and I hope that's not the case, maybe if they could indicate that they have to, because there's quite a bit of an, uh, business to go through. 4.30. 4.30. 4 4 Five. 4.40. Four o'clock. <laughs> Ten o'clock. Okay. This morning. Okay. <laughs> well, we'll see how you get on, and if I allow you to leave, then <laughs> so be it. Okay, uh, members. Currently, um, most of our members have received the packs electronically. Uh, I do know some members, including myself, were having some difficulty with my uh, tablet this week, and I couldn't get to IT, so I'm using the hard copy. So those of you still receive the printed pack would be content to receive papers uh, 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 electronically um, in the future. Um, I know uh, we have been given the option up until now, but uh, I suppose all committees are looking at the way we use our electronic devices and our hard copy packs. So if anyone is still using a printed pack and would be content to receive papers electronically uh, going forward, could you let Danielle um, know of that? Dinosaur here. <laughs> And finally, the third point I want to raise in relation to financial scrutiny training that has been delivered to all of the committees here in the Assembly. The training is part of a series of workshops which will cover in-year monitoring of departmental expenditure. And the training for this committee has been scheduled for 1.30 on Wednesday, the 24th of September, in this room. This will take place prior to our scheduled weekly meeting. Um, and I would ask members to make an effort to be here for the training. So it obviously uh, lasts for 30 minutes. Mm -hmm. So that's the 24th of September, 1.30 in this room. Um, uh, there will be a reminder sent closer to the time. Yeah, on ahead. Um, just with regard to that training, um, you may have been offered it uh, through other committees that you're on. So if you are planning to attend as part of another committee, um, we'd be grateful if you could let us know because no point us, you know, sort of mm. bringing you along to something that you're already going to be. We are, aren't we? Yeah, yeah. Education. 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 Okay, so. <coughs> financial needs. Okay. Yeah. So, so, so for. it depends on the you time and how, hover, how it fits into your dates and diaries. I mean, as long as you avail of it through a committee, you yeah. know, but for this committee, it's Wednesday the 24th at 1.30 okay. in this room. Thanks. Oh, okay, members. Um, members, apologies. I've received apologies from uh, Ross Hussey and Dahi Mackay. Are members aware of any other apologies? Nice. Any other apologies? Oh, yeah, yeah. Michael uh, also. I think Michael's out of the country. Yeah. <laughs> okay, members. Um, the minutes of the last meeting are at page six of your electronic packs. And for those using the blue packs, are members consent? Contempt for me to sign them into the Move. public record. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Agreed. Agenda item three under correspondence. We have correspondence from the Finance Committee to CNAG, and it's at page 11 of your electronic packs. Um, it's correspondence from the Committee of Finance and Personnel in relation to the year-end uh, surges. Uh, and in all of the departments, the letter refers to a research paper on the issue that was considered by the Finance Committee on the 2nd of July. Are members content to note the correspondence at page 11? Yeah. Agreed. Yeah. Kieran, would you and your team want to come forward? 
UK members. Uh, we also have correspondence from David McNary, MLA, which is at page 12. Um, it's correspondence from Mr McNary in relation to the Northern Ireland Events Company and the decision by Detty not to publish the findings of its recently completed investigation. So, members, are you content to note this mm -hmm. correspondence yeah. and we forward it on to CNAG for his consideration? Yeah, I think that's OK. Members OK to note that and, and, and forward this correspondence on to Mr Donnelly? Yep. Agreed? Yeah, uh, I can come okay. back with a fuller report. Not. OK. OK, thank you, Kieran. Um, I suppose the only thing I would say, I, I received a copy of this report on the 29th of August. It's quite a substantial document. But I will come back then and in writing. Once your team have read yes. through the findings, you'll report back. OK, thank you, Kieran. Um, uh, we will also send a holding reply to Mr McNary, um, awaiting the auditor's response. OK. Mm -hmm. Members, agenda item four is ministerial a couple of ministerial directions in relation to the areas of natural constraint scheme and transitional support for farmers in disadvantaged areas. That's at page 14 of your packs. Uh, the direction issued by the Agriculture Minister uh, relates to the provision of 2.1 million in transition payments to disadvantaged areas. The issue gave uh, rise to the ministerial direction is that the departmental officials advised the minister that the project did not represent value for money. The CNAG has drawn this matter to our attention and the payments will be subject to the audit office usual audit procedures in the course of the annual audit of DARD resource accounts. Uh, Kieran, do you want to make any comments in relation to the ministerial direction? Uh, Chair, I have nothing to add to what you have already said there. I think that sums it up uh, precisely. Mm -hmm. yep. Okay, members. Mm -hmm. Trevor? Yeah, maybe just will In terms of that, I mean, I suppose we have heard in the past in terms of DARD and some of their practices where they get heavily fined by Europe. So, given that maybe CNAG has made a you know, comment on this, that it would be useful maybe to give us a maybe more outline or prepare some paper on this, actually tell us what the problem the pitfalls are, and give us something to come down the line in the future. Because I remember there was concern from some people within other sections of the farming community in relation to how this scheme was rolled out. So, if any of them decide to raise this with Europe, then what way do we stand in terms of that? Um, likely, one of these particular schemes is actually going to be partly financed by EU monies. So there's two elements to this. Mm -hmm. um, there's uh, financial support for the, mo there's the most disadvantaged areas, then there's the disadvantaged areas. Uh, so what the department is proposing uh, for the seriously disadvantaged areas is that uh, a programme costing £40 million, um, will run for an initial period of two years. Uh, with 20 million paid up to 2016, but there are existing schemes uh, which do the, more or less the same thing, uh, and uh, there's no specific issue here as regards um, no clawback from from Europe. There's a separate set of issues uh, related to clawback to do with single farm payment, uh, but that that's a that's a separate issue, and it's one that uh, I have uh, reported on in my audit of the. 13, 14 DART accounts. I can come back to the committee with uh, more detail on that, but that, that is a separate a separate mm -hmm. issue. Okay. I'm, to, I'm to understand that not all of that money has been paid out. Is that correct? Well, what we're dealing with here in the direct, the, this is just uh, yes, approval right. to yeah. pay, so uh, this is for the future. Yeah. Yep. Okay, members, we're content to, to note the ministerial direction and hear no. I, I'm, I'm still a bit confused. And if it's ministerial direction as opposed to, it seems that the minister is going against the wishes of our officials. So I, I think, there's a, I mean, I think we should be cautious as well, given we are the public accounts committee. That where is the caution coming from? What will the outcomes be if something arises from that? And it's for that reason I think that we need to get more information on it. 
Okay. Uh, well, well, the argument is probably coming from the the Dard economists uh, on pure value for money grounds. Yeah. Uh, that um, you know, if uh, these payments are made uh, in areas of say low income, they should be made through the welfare system rather than through Dard. So, so it's that type of argument. Now, these type of payments have been made for maybe 20, 30 years. So. They're long-running schemes, uh, and these are just uh, replacements. So that, that's the argument that was coming from uh, Dar, Dar Economist. Okay. Uh, now, this has been approved. Um, I think it's been discussed at executive level. This has been approved. Been and, uh, I just see in there. Been been first yeah. Okay. John, you wanted to come in? Uh, chairperson. I'm not sure if other members of the are aware or not, but there has been, an, I think, an increasing number of ministerial directives. Mm -hmm. My own, leaving this one aside, my own suspicion is that there are accounting officers in very high positions, well paid, who are refusing to take responsibility for decisions and take the easy way out by invoking a ministerial direction and then mm. in the future this committee won't be able to cross-examine or quiz them about why they made that decision. Now, I'm open to correction if that's a wrong assessment of what's happening. I can see the logic for what was a direction here. Some departments will use them more extensively than others. Uh, there have been quite a lot of DARD, I think that's all I would say. Uh, and there are certain occasions when there's a need for a yeah. clear need for a ministerial. The direction. hard weather, pa the uh -huh. hard weather payment, and that was, a, was one of the ones I think that. Chris, did you? No, want I was to just going to get clarification, but I've seen it in the document. Okay. Okay, uh, members, uh, Karen, um, certainly the issue that Trevor raised. You, you, you're going to come back. Uh, the separate issues yeah. just on EU disallowances, yeah. I, I, I can come back on that. Okay. Okay, members, um, moving on to agenda item five, um, a ministerial direction on the provision of temporary funding for tier two family support services in the Greater Shankill and West Belfast areas. Those are integrated services for children and young people's project, mm -hmm. which is at page 19, uh, members. Um, the direction issued by the Health Minister relates to the provision of 266,000 uh, of funding to create space to allow new family support arrangements to become established and fully bedded in. This issue cross, cuts across the Departments of Health and Social Development and uh, due to this cross-cutting, the Department of Health uh, sought and gained executive approval to provide the temporary funding on the 8th of August there uh, uh, of this year. The issue that gave rise to the ministerial direction is that the departmental officials have advised that the project does not represent value for money. Uh, the CNAG has drawn this matter to our atten uh, attention and intends to monitor the expenditure uh, on the project as part of the normal audit processes and will report any significant issues to the committee as required. Um, do you have any comments, Kieran, in relation to, to the direction? Uh, other than to make the point, Chair, that this is a, a temporary funding arrangement uh, that's just to run for six months up to December 2014 until new arrangements are established, so it's short term. Okay. Trevor? So in terms of short term, does that mean there's no automatic extension to that? No, they're coming up with a new, a new regime. Um, Post-December, so yeah. it's, uh, this is just to enable the funding arrangement to, to finish in, off the programme, is uh, it? To finish yeah. off the yeah. programme. So. In, in terms of consistency, I mean, just, um, I mean, in, in taking the one I made the point about earlier, um, I still, I still have a, a problem where economists come up with something to say that something's not value for money. But, and I mean, this is ministers from my own party, but I'm still, I'm still quizzing why. That if economists are saying that something's not good value for money, why do, it? Why do we do it? And and then giving you are the, mm -hmm. the man in charge of the audit office because why? I wouldn't want to see in yes. 18 months' time that Kieran Donnelly come out and saying that actually they knew of this scheme and mm -hmm. actually wasted hundreds of thousands of pounds of public money, and 
us having to have a discussion with you about that. Yeah. Uh -huh. I think in a case like this, that's fairly un unlikely. Um, now, uh, you can see the, um, the, co the concept of a scheme like this is a good one, where, um, uh, where there are families with complex needs and different government agencies uh, should work together. Mm -hmm. So it's actually an example of uh, joined up working across government. So yeah. the, the concept is, is a good one. I think what they're saying is that this rollover of this particular initiative isn't value for money, but um, onto something better is put in place. Mm -hmm. uh, the, 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 um, there's a wider argument for doing it. So usually uh, um, there is an argument on wider grounds beyond uh, strict value for money. Uh, so quite a number of these directions were coming up. There are wider factors to be uh, brought to bear. I think it's a case where it might not be economically viable, but certainly in terms of the social impact that it has, you know, it does reap rewards. Paul, you wanted to just just on that and appreciate that this is a historic one that has been yes. coming, uh, and it, it's it's a matter of dealing with the continuation until uh, the end of whatever the, the additional monies runs out. But what I, what I always have a fear of one, and I'm wondering, do we have a way or a mechanism of checking where monies are put in to deliver a particular project to a department which is seen to be part of their overall budget of, let's say, and I'm using health, the 4.7 billion, that next time com coming round, because they've had this funded, and maybe it falls off the radar as not being good value for money, therefore it doesn't get funded the next time. Does that come off their block, or do they class that as part of their ongoing, and they come back next year and say, well, we need that plus additional monies? And I'm, I'm just wondering, is there a mechanism for us to check that programmes which have been included in budgets that maybe are not even delivered are not seen as part of their their budget to work with. And I'm thinking more trusts would be the ones who would deal with those sorts of issues where they get money to run a particular programme that might not necessarily run, but it's then seen as part of their ongoing running costs every year on year, and therefore it's included in their projected mm -hmm. estimates or their projected uh, uh, budgets for the following year. Well, well, there is a present. Uh, most funding is through block. But sometimes uh, we have known what's earmarked funds that are to be used for a specific purpose. Yes. Uh, and uh, if that purpose is specifically earmarked, then uh, there'll be an onus on us to check that the money has been used for that purpose rather than some other purpose. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm highlighting trust here because I'm aware that they have received funding to run programmes that they did not run. And I'm, just, I'm not saying that this is not one. This is one of them. Uh -huh. I'm saying that. That is something that I am aware of. It was brought to my attention by a commissioning body attached to the Northern, Northeastern or the Northern uh, Trust. <coughs> they highlighted concerns that this was, and it was seen as instead of just to deliver a program, it's just seen as part of their budget. And the next year they look for their budget plus additional monies, and that's the way it is. So. No, I'd be happy to yeah, talk to you on that. And, and the guys, the guys would be happy to talk on this matter as well, face to face mm -hmm. on it. They, they're the people who could put the, the meat and the bones on it. Okay, um, members. Just Can maybe, Kieran, could you maybe enlighten me a wee bit on mm -hmm. the, uh, page twenty-one of it? Their issue giving rise to direction. Then this. The, the necessity for such a direction arose due to the concerns that it cannot be demonstrated that the continuation of the funding was value for money. So the ministerial direction was given. I know, I understand the, the two communities and the need for it from a family point of view, but the ministerial direction was given more money to a project that couldn't guarantee that it was value for money already. Yeah. Um, it's just at the beginning of that paragraph. Uh, well, the, issue giving well, the, the minister then would take a wider view. I would think um, so. And along the line, notwithstanding all of this, uh, we okay. There's a value for money investment. Uh, other big ministers were concerned that there are families in both yeah, areas yeah. whose needs for support services uh, were being met under this regime, uh, and the need continues to exist. 
So, uh, in other words, they're, they're bringing a, a wider set of factors mm -hmm. over and above a, a pure value for money assessment in, into the mix. Uh, and that is any of these directions would fall into that, that sort of category. Thank you. Okay, members. Um, we'll note that ministerial direction also on that one. Moving on to agenda item six. Um, Brandon, you're very welcome. Um, we have correspondence from uh, Mr. Pengelly, the accounting officer for DHSSPS, on the MOR to the uh, fire service uh, report, which is at page 32, members of your PACs. Um, the accounting officer for the Department of Health provides our requested progress report on our report on the fire and rescue service. If members want to take a moment just to consider the correspondence. Can I declare an entrance? Yeah. Okay. Members want to make a comment or are content with the request and the progress report on our recommendations? See, we're talking about the Interim Chief Executive and the Interim Chief Fire Officer. When are they going to be substantive posts as opposed to Interim? Whenever they retire. Uh, no, um, let's see. I think there's been reappointments in both uh, for a further two years from 1st of April 2014. Uh, when the committee looked at this, I think one of the issues was there was a lot of instability and temporary appointments in, in senior management. Uh, so, but I understand that the top two posts, that's uh, the chief executive and the chief fire officer, whilst they're continuing to be filled on an interim basis, uh, there's continuity with both being reappointed uh, really up to end of March 2016. What will happen then? They retire. But then they'll be making substantive one. appointments. Well, it doesn't actually say anywhere they will. Uh, well, I, I presume that's mm. uh, what would happen. But at least. Uh, but you won't want to enter in terms of our interim mm -hmm. appointment after that, uh, dare you? So, in terms of stability, it's st at least there it. is uh, yeah. more stability mm -hmm. in structure than, mm -hmm. than there was. Mm -hmm. But, but how, how can you say that? Well, for two. Yeah. Well, I mean. Chief executive, and chief executive, uh, two-year contract. Mm -hmm. None suggest that person will be sooner. Oh, uh, so sure. so that, that could happen anywhere. Yes. Yes. So yeah. in terms of perception, uh -huh. an organisation. Mm -hmm. I mean, in my mind, you would think someone who's wanting to get a job on and want to be successful in it mm -hmm. um, will want to make a career out of it, as opposed to a two-year post. I presume that's the maximum this can go on for. Mm -hmm. uh, probably yes. Yeah. yeah. So, so, to my mind, that gives a. I think that just continues that uncertainty. Yeah. I would rather see someone point out and post it. It's going to make a career out of it and make a make a success out of it. I just oh, concerned that oh. you know, two years that time up this pension or what's the crack there? Like, you know. Okay, John, you wanted to make a comment. Also. Chair, personally, we can put my eight of them off track, but like. The others, I'm concerned that we continue to have an interim chief executive who is developing a vision for the Northern Ireland Fire and Rescue Service. Now, in the meantime, we made a big issue of one Land Rover. In the meantime, nine Land Rovers have appeared. And we've had a public statement from the fire service saying they would have difficulty managing their budget. In the same time, and I'm sure other members may have had visits as well, by members of the Voluntary Rescue Service, who point out to me that those four before vehicles 
that are needed for uh, wildfires or mountain rescues. The mountain rescue team has got them. The Coast Guards have got them. The voluntary duplication. Yes. The, uh, there was boat spot as well. And I'm sure members will recall the scenes in England, which we would never want, where people had to be rescued from homes and main streets and boats. With the boats, I'm told, that the fire service have bought are seven metre things that never could be used in those circumstances. Good for fishing, though. Well, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Now, you know, members know fine well that there's long established rescue services like FOIL. Mm -hmm. Call search and rescue. Uh, for MANA. They're, 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 and these are people in large numbers. Give the time freely, do their own voluntary. And it just seems to me that having an interim chief executive who's just developing a vision is adamant that he now has a statutory responsibility to go out on a spending spree and buy all these new Land Rovers. You probably saw them on TV because invariably you get pictured in front of them. And there's just a need for a continuing watch on what this organisation is up to because I'm very conscious that the Minister of Health has responsibility. He is struggling to provide drugs for people. And at the same time, this uh, arm's length body has, has bought a, a fleet of new Land Rovers that I'm told weren't needed and that their statutory responsibility for rescue is overstretched, to put it mildly. And, you know, somebody did point out to me that Northern Ireland is the shape of a bowl. The water mostly goes into Loch Ney and there's one river called the Ban takes it out. You don't have scenes of flooding like unfortunately happened in England. When's the last time uh, anybody heard of a wildfire called Grant? It doesn't happen. Uh, so I, I don't know, maybe I'm going off a tangent, but what I'm saying is, despite the best efforts of, of this committee to keep a focus on that organisation, uh, they still need to be uh, managed by somebody who's more than an interim chief executive who's just developing a vision for the future. And I say that with all sincerity, and I say it and full acknowledgement of the courageous work that the firefighters on the ground are doing and have done for many years in trying circumstances. And that's not to be confused with management issues. Okay, thank you, Deputy Chairperson. I suppose uh, I'm sure members will, will share your con the concern of your sentiment, obviously, around the relation to uh, the possibility that cars and boats may have been bought since since our inquiry, but obviously there's two sides to every story and we don't know No, that's true, what I, that is. I accept that. So, but, so, you know, since you have mentioned cars, have we got any, made any progress on the promise to uh, audit. Make, bring the fire service cars into harmony with the ambulance cars and all the other emergency services? Or are these still going around with no markings on them of any description. Where you know where the, I believe there was a promise that that would be done, and I think any society expects to have their emergency vehicles properly marked out, and that we don't accept excuses. Oh, they can weave through traffic because they've got no identity. Paul, what I actually think having an identity might help them get through Absolutely. traffic. But. The part, it's the last paragraph. I have attached the requested progress report and can advise the department will be working closely with Northern Ireland Fire and Rescue Service in taking forward the necessary actions. Well, that's the necessary actions are some of the points that John has just alluded to in relation to the vehicles and all of those matters. I, I don't think that we're we're not really accepting. They've had a number of months to actually start moving it. Some of the things could have been dealt with immediately. It wasn't an action was needed. It was a matter of putting processes in place quickly to ensure that, that the correct measures were, were, were there to ensure that we could have confidence uh, and transparency in the whole process. That is, that is a very bland 
brush over statement as far as I'm concerned. Uh, and I think that we now need to say, well, look, we're going to put our deadline on it. I think in a year's time, we will not just be looking for an update report. I think we will be asking them to come back to update us on the implementation of all of the actions and the outworkings of them. And that will, maybe that might be a better way of putting a little bit of finality to the matter and saying we want to have not just not just reporting back, we want to have uh, uh, an evidence session in relation to uh, the recommendations that were put forward from this committee and how those are working through. And I, I, maybe we're overstepping our mark on that point, but I, I, I don't feel we are because I think we, had, we were so concerned about the way the whole thing had been managed before that now this is a, a, a way of giving us confidence. We need to have confidence that we are saying, whenever you as an auditor are signing off the reports, that that we as a committee as well have confidence to actually not be looking into the detail of dotting every I and stroking every T, because we would hope and pray that they are doing that. At the minute, we don't. And we don't have that confidence. Keen, uh, unless well, you want to well, make I think it would be also helpful if my people did a bit of supplementary follow-up work. And I think I did say we were going to do that the last time yeah. this was discussed here. Chairperson, there was one important thing I forgot to, and it fits in very nicely with what Paul has said. There is loads of evidence that the voluntary rescue service has gone to enormous lengths to engage with the senior management. And while they met them a couple of times, nothing happens. Now, I doubt if anybody around this table wouldn't encourage the maximum uh, cooperation between the voluntary sector of, of, of any part of society and the statutory. And I think that's that's probably the key point that I missed when I was describing all that. I think, and, and Paul, you did allude to maybe having a, a, some sort of a session with, with them. Maybe I, I we've got this report, the six-month progress report, and there. Well, that doesn't some, really tell us an awful no, lot. No, some members have no. concerns about some of the issues that are in it. I think it's a matter of you know just window dressing as opposed to actually implementation, and you know taking forward the necessary actions. That there was a number of things that could have been actioned immediately, and I would like to have seen that those were actioned immediately. And Trevor's right. You know, the interim chief chief officers, the concerns that people have about those terms, and uh, if 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 they're going to be in position for two years, why are they called an interim? You know, I don't see that as a temporary position. A temporary position is six weeks or something while we're trying to sort something out, not two years. You know, okay. any other organisation in the private sector couldn't exist without a managing director in post for two years. Well, we've got uh, his brother's acting up on his behalf while he's, while, he's, while he's not here. That's not the way it works. Okay, members, so will we agree to write back to the fire service stating, outlining our concerns? And um, I suppose uh, Paul did allude to a further session maybe with the fire service in relation to some of those concerns and indeed the uh, Succession plans that, that, that we have concerns around. Yeah, agreed. Would have agreed to do that? Yeah. Agreed? Yeah. Agreed. Okay. Okay, members, uh, moving on, we have correspondence uh, from Mr. Will Hare, the Accounting Officer for DSD, on the Housing Executive Management of Response Maintenance Contracts Report, which is at pages 35 to 77 of your PACs. Um, in, chorus, in the correspondence from the accounting officer is a response to a request for further information in relation to the MOR to our Housing Executive Management of Response Maintenance Contracts report. This correspondence addresses the committee's request, which is uh, in your tabled packs of 13, 14 accounts. Members, so if you just want to take a moment just to, to look over that, it's at pages 35. And if members want to make a comment on the correspondence. Yeah. It's quite extensive, the, the correspondence members, so um, I'm hoping you've all done your homework. And <laughs> 
unravel page by page. Um, quite a bit of work has gone into to this, and I'm sure you will agree there's a lot of good outcomes coming out of that report. I think that's a, 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 a they've gone a good way to try and to address a number of the mm -hmm. things that we're concerned about. Mm -hmm. I think I think even down to their staff uh, code of conduct and the the changes that have been made within that document. Uh, I think that that's yeah. great help. Yeah, I think it's very evidential within the the full report that they've given us that they have set out a number of margins around. A lot of the issues that were, were publicly discussed, and indeed not just with this committee but others. So I think they've gone some way, and they'd have to be commended on it. Brandon, do you want to make any comment on it? Uh, well, I think uh, things are a lot better than they were when the committee looked at this in 2012. So there's progress on all the, the big recommendations. Um, the report at that time was mainly on false maintenance. It also touched on problems with land maintenance. Uh, I've just um, signed off my audit opinion on the executive's accounts for 2013-14. Uh, my opinion on yeah. maintenance is still qualified. There's still, while well, a lot of progress has been made, uh, there's still some problem areas. Uh, I'll flag up, for example. Uh, Eaton contracts in particular. So there's still more work to be done, uh, but it's a lot better than, than it was. Uh, also, I should say, uh, the DSD committee have asked us to appear exactly tomorrow uh, just to give them an update on, on progress as well. Okay, members, um, no sure. other. Sir, can I just, well, never you say about heating contracts, care of what? Like you say, are you talking about? Uh, well, just basic just inspection that work has been done, uh, both the standard and the, the quality. So it's just, uh, yeah, there, there appeared to be a confusion between uh, the housing executive and the contractors in relation to um, uh, uh, servicing of, of boilers mm -hmm. when it should be done. Uh, Period and so forth. So that is something that is being discussed now. No, I just know you said that when we did in my office. I think that the heating contractor out some like seven times, and still her, her boiler wasn't going. And that was the middle of the last one. Like, you know, and she came back down, and the next day we were ringing up again, getting them back again. They came back and said, "Oh, nothing wrong here. It wouldn't work." And I think they finished up putting the whole new motorised, new motorised system on top to get it to go. This is a pensioner, you love him, the only heat and sad was that heat. probably got paid the seven times as well. probably did. Uh -huh. um, there's also one of the issues that the committee raised at the time was um, this number of contractors were in financial difficulty. Uh, yeah. Talk about pricing bids uh, very low. So, so some contractors have. Folded. Yeah, uh, and then that has meant uh, that the work is transferred to the executive's direct labour organisation. Uh, so it's a much bigger outfit than it was uh, a couple of years ago. Have we any way of measuring the benefit from the DLO point of view, uh, as opposed to uh, what was operating? Very, very important question. <laughs> uh, DLOs historically don't have a good record. Track record. Mm -hmm. um, uh, whilst there are problems with contractors, there were always there was problems with DLO. Uh, it is very important uh, that there are measures in place to assess DLO efficiency, uh, and uh, Anne and I would need to be kept in that. Now, whether the growth of DLO is a temporary thing, uh, uh, until they get new contracts worked up, uh, so it may not be a, a permanent feature. It certainly has given rise to increased costs, and I think one of the concerns the committee had was that, um, as CNAG mentioned there, was the fact that we had low ball uh, bids coming in, which the committee had concerns about are these sustainable uh, in terms of that? Would uh, 
firms actually go under and the proof of the pudding since the, the, the committee's report we've had three firms that have gone under. But on that same point, Brandon, this is one of the things that puzzled me about public procurement for many tenders open, particularly in, the, in the, that building end, where they're coming in at national rates and under. So how and how they can be verified by the public sector where someone can come in at rates below the national rate and be awarded a contract. So if your rate is £16 an hour is a standard rate for a tradesman, but they can come in at 12 To me, the alarm bell should ring, but should. councils seem to actually still appoint contracts um, on the basis of that, because yeah, they think there, it's worth money. presumption that uh, if you have them, you have to automatically go to... I don't think that's if there's a bid that looks as if it's underpriced, uh, then the duty on the client side to actually query that. Uh, uh, you can't, but Karen, you can't have minus rates. No. <laughs> you can't have minus rates, but, but what you could have is lost leaders. Uh, well, you get minus rates if you. Uh -huh. but the problem is the management of the contract. Uh -huh. So a two-hour job all of a sudden takes four hours. Yeah, but but I mean, that was always my concern, the public sector, and how they, they evaluate it in some of their contracts. I think it, it does open up a wider question about uh, public sector procurement. And one, of the, one, of the, one, of the aspect, one of the recommendations, or part of that recommendation that the, the committee made was that in terms of reviewing the operation of these contracts, uh, the lessons would be shared across the public sector, and we shared through DFP and the Central Procurement Directorate. And I think it would be a, um, worthwhile, perhaps, if the committee followed up and were to maybe uh, ask to what extent that has now been that information has been shared with CPD and what consideration they have given to uh, and actually get a view from them and low, uh, low bids for what that review would be worth. I would have to add um, the, the difficulty for me is uh, the way CPD has went over this last number of years is they're placing the small companies out. The big guys, they're putting certain more and more standards in place that they have to price, but they're still coming under under the standard rates. Yeah. So that says to me, how are they coming in under standard rates, actually having all the standards that they're supposed to have in terms of qualifications and memberships of trade bodies, mm. but coming in under standard rates to win contracts? Yet the honest wee man that all of us want to represent here, who has got a small building firm, can't price them because he's not in whatever recognised trade bodies, and he's coming in for a reasonable wage for doing a reasonable job, and he's been honest and forthright in how he does it. But others are coming in under, that, under the standard rate for doing the job and still get awarded. I, I think that this, this issue does, does raise that um, problem because there have been additional costs, with, uh, with CNAG mentioned, where the firms have gone uh, under. The staff in those firms have transferred across to the housing executive. The housing executive are having to pick up the salary bills. And to give you some indication of what it's there, in 2013, the DLO salary bill was for just under four and a half million pounds. Next year, or the current year, they're anticipating that to be around about 11 million. So, you know, the backstop in all of this is the public sector who end up picking up the salary bill, and it does open up a wider question and debate, which I think um, CPD need to really take a hard look at and consider in the broader sense of what, what is going on here. Mm -hmm. Just, just on the back to the DLO issue because I, I had occasion to visit a, a house where the housing executive had brought a contractor in to do work, and the resident was not happy at the way the work was finished. Now, if I lived in the house, I wouldn't have been happy either. But they believed it was fine, you know, that had been done. But then the housing executive decided to bring in their own DLO to do, sort out the problem. And I can tell you, this is where I'm not so sure because the quality of the work was <laughs> dramatic. Was so bad. Oh, it was a lot better. It was. I can. I can only say that the house was. I would have been happy with it, whereas before, it, you know, I wouldn't have been happy at all. But genuinely, it's how do you put a value on what the type of finish that they're doing because. When I when I ha asked the housing executive about it, they said, "But we had only allocated so much time to the contractor to do that, and as a consequence, he was doing it to a price." But albeit, they paid twice the money because they had to bring back their own men and do it themselves. Mm -hmm. And albeit, they did do a good job and finished it perfect. 
And I wouldn't have said it took them much longer, but it was just enough time. They were able to take whatever time it took to finish it, and they did it. And it, 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 it was money well spent, as opposed to spending money to a guy and saying, you have an hour and a half to do that job in, but really it's going to should take you two and a half hours, but you only get an hour and a half. And as a consequence, they're going to cut corners. And if they're not making money some way, they have to squeeze it out of another. I'm not sure that we're, we're looking at like with like. You know, it's, I need to see if we're getting, getting, it, getting it right, because sometimes the DLO can give you a far better job at the end of the day, maybe than what you were getting by a contractor who's trying to do it as quick as possible and get out. And, and, and where do you put the value in that? It's a bit like the home helps. Yeah. It's where do you put the value on, you know, it's, mm. it, 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 you're cutting, cutting the cloth, corners. not yeah, right. Yeah. Cutting off your nose despite your face, I suppose. Kieran, are you content enough members then to, yeah. to, to note this and, and, and stay on that? Okay, members, um, we also have correspondence from Will Hare, the accounting officer for DSD, on creating effective partnerships between government and voluntary community sector, which is at pages 78 through to 84 of your packs. Um, the accounting officer for DSD has sent a request, uh, obviously is, re is responding to a request for an update after 12 months of the committee considering the MOR on the creative effect of par creating effective partnerships between government and voluntary uh, and community sector. The report uh, was published in January 2012, and we considered a previous update on this matter um, last April, April of 2013. DSD reports on significant uh, progress on all of the 11 PAC recommendations within it. The majority have now been implemented in, rela in relation to recommendation three. Members will note that significant progress has been made on strengthening uh, relationships between the voluntary and community uh, and public sector group. This includes the establishment of the addressing the bureaucracy report, which will impact positively across a range of, of the PAC recommendations and contribute uh, substantially uh, in meeting the Department's commitments as outlined in the MOR. So members, um, I'm sure it's at page 78, uh, please have had a look at it. Um, does anybody want to make a comment? And I think it's, it's good the progress that they are taking forward in terms of addressing issues around bureaucracy within departments, and that's very good. It makes good reading for the uh, voluntary and community sector. Do members want to um, make a comment on the correspondence, or are we content to, to note this? Well, just note it and certainly welcome it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Kieran, do you want to make any comment? Uh, Ron is very close to involved. Mm -hmm. <coughs> to okay. uh, I think this is um, DSD, I think, take all reports seriously, as, as you've seen with the previous one in response maintenance. Uh, this one is no different. Uh, they have really uh, grasped this one in terms of wanting to solve this problem, which has been around for a long, long time. Uh, and they are making very significant progress. Um, the audit office has been involved. We, we've been we've been involved in a, in a project group, uh, a steering group, uh, project board, and project team, uh, working uh, with um, DSD, with uh, DFP, with NICFA, uh, representatives of local councils, all the departments, and in terms of there is a, a very significant uh, there has been a very significant amount of work undertaken, which. Uh, will culminate, uh, the plan is, in the issue of new, uh, which will be uh, mandatory guidance uh, issued under a DAO, which will be later this year or early next year, uh, in terms which um, departments uh, and uh, agencies, etc., will be uh, required to comply with, or if not, explain why not. Uh, the government funders database has been given a new lease of life. Councils are already uh, recording their, their information on that. Uh, there are moves now for the health boards and the education and library boards to, to uh, record our funding on that. So there is a significant amount of work. Uh, I think um, 
we are um, very pleasantly surprised at how far this has actually gone forward. It has proven to be a, a difficult nut to crack in the past, uh, but this time they look as if they have actually done that. Uh, so I think it is a very positive story. Mm. I suppose in terms of good practice and compliance, this will hopefully the, the fruits of the labour will be seen on the ground. Absolutely, and it's uh, it's a brilliant example of joined up government that's now taking place with just the cooperation that there's been, and it will uh, reduce the level of the level of bureaucracy that is around there. We have lead funders are going to be put in place, a uh, uh, um, single point of verification. Uh, so it is a a very useful uh, piece of work that's been been done. That will transcend into the, the new councils as well, yes. which is, I suppose, a piece of work that is already ongoing, is it? And that work is already. The councils are, are actively involved in it. They, they mm. realise now, with the new councils coming in, that they want to adopt these, these policies and principles, and they see the advantage of using the, gov uh, the government funders database as well. Department of Justice, who uh, have joined in the scheme as well, in terms of, of uh, taking the, the template for the um, the, um, for assessing uh, um, projects for funding and how to monitor those, they have taken that, that on board as well. So it is, uh, it is across government, it is across local government, and will find its way out into the, the health and education sectors as well. Very good. Members, do you want to make comments? Are you content? Yeah. Happy enough to note them. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Brandon. Okay, and just moving on from that correspondence at page 85, members. Um, of your packs is correspondence from DSD's voluntary and community unit on creating uh, effective partnerships between government and voluntary and community sector report. This correspondence uh, includes the completed modernisation fund capital and revenue evaluations, as well as copies of the interim evaluation of the modernisation fund uh, uh, capital. The final evaluation of the modernisation revenue programme, and it relates to the recommendation 10 of our report. Uh, the final evaluation concludes that the capital modernisation fund, which differs from other capital programmes, uh, focuses on capital as a tool for community improvement, which is a key deliverable of the programme um, and has been the utility of capital assets in the form of buildings or equipment to meet the uh, programme's objectives of improving local communities and producing public value. The programme was delivered through an intermediary body consisting of three key voluntary organisations possessing the relevant skills necessary for the programme delivery. Uh, the report also notes that a key outcome has been the acquisition of considerable skills by the department and um, the intermediary body in facilitating and sustaining successful partnerships uh, working within large complex capital projects. It is suggested that this learning should now be harnessed to inform the development of a template for facilitating partnership working within capital projects for future capital programmes. Finally, the evaluation makes 10 recommendations for the future to further improve this model. So again, just moving on from our previous correspondence, it's similar in its, its vein, so that also has to be welcomed. Um, Brandon, have you, do you want to comment on any of that? Just... So members, are we content that we write to the department, I uh, suppose maybe commending them on the uh, substantial progress that has been made, achieved under the, these programmes, and, and particularly against our recommendations, expressing our support in the transfer of learning and sharing of good practice across from this programme. And this is something hopefully communities that we represent will benefit from in the future uh, uh, when it comes to the levels of bureaucracy that they have muted to us in the past in terms so of grant aid. Like, yeah. Mm. yeah. So we'll write to them. Um, commending them on, on, on this, and I think yeah. we've always said we, where we will commend um, departments for doing uh, the good work that they do, we will. 
Okay, members, uh, moving on, uh, we have correspondence from uh, Mr David Sterling, Accounting Officer for DFP, uh, on the MOR of the transfer of former military and security sites to the Executive and ILEX accounts 2010-11 report. The liabilities. Which, <laughs> which are at pages 181 of your pack. So, members, the accounting officer for DFP, in response to a request for clarification of a term used in the MOR on the transfer of former military and security sites into the executive. So, members, are we, are we content to note this response? Yeah. I'm content to note, yeah. I think it's, yeah. It, it reads for itself. Okay, members, um, we have also uh, correspondence from the Audit Office on an issue raised by our Deputy Chairperson in relation to Phoenix Gas, which is at uh, page 182 of your packs. Uh, the Deputy Chairperson raised this early this year regarding the salary of the Chief Executive of Phoenix Gas and a perceived conflict of interest in relation to appointee to the Board of the Utility Regular. A regulator, I beg your pardon. Kieran, uh, do you want to comment on the content of the correspondence? Uh, yes, Chair. Uh, the first issue as regards um, salary payments to CEO of Phoenix Gas. Um, we had raised this matter with the utility regulator uh, who sets price controls for, for these companies. Um, now, uh, According to the utility reg regulator, she has no role in setting the salary of any employee in a regulated company. Uh, so those are matters for the individual company. So this is a, a private company. Uh, so there are also matters that are outside my remit as well. On the second issue on the safe conflict of interest, uh, this is one that we probed further during our audit of the utility regulator. Uh, and something we raised with the, the regulator. Um, and uh, we were told that um, the regulator was, they were working to remove the conflict. Um, I think the latest situation is um, the appointee has resigned from the, the board of the, the regulator and uh, no longer participates in regulator business. Uh, we understand prior to the resignation, uh, they were working on certain committees, but the, these were dealing with non-electricity issues, so just gas. So uh, there has been a development on, on that issue. Okay, thank you. Uh, Trevor, and then Deputy Chairperson. Just, uh, I think it was a typo, page 183, um, 25th September 2014, should surely be 13, just for accuracy. Okay. What page, sorry? Page 183. I know John wants to say some complimentary things about this guy, but... Oh, no. I don't, <laughs> I, I don't think he could have said them on the 25th of September 14. <laughs> OK, yeah, absolutely. Thank you for making that correction. Um, just, just on the Phoenix Gas uh, one, uh, John, you raised the issue initially. Do you want to make a comment on the, on the response? Only very briefly, Chairperson. Uh, I certainly was aware that the total income of the chief executive was in the region of £700,000. Now I understand that Mr Peter Dixon has now moved on and has left the post, so that's history. Uh, interestingly enough, the conflict of interest on the utility board centred on Mr McCracken, who was there representing electricity consumers, and there has been protracted discussions about that. And I understand recently Mr McCracken uh, resigned from the post on the utility board. So that effectively, Chairperson, removes the conflict of interest. And indeed I would wish to acknowledge the role of the Chairperson of the Utility Board, who in this whole issue I believed uh, was impeccable in how he, how he dealt with it. Yes, he tried to work with the conflict of interest issue. The papers supplied to Mr McCracken were redacted, but the, the major flaw in it was that Mr McCracken was representing electricity consumers. So, in fact, while that was going on, electricity consumers had no representation. 
I understand the plan now is to replace him with two, and we certainly will watch with, with interest. But, uh, you know, I do think that we need to be extremely careful, and sometimes people will slip up. We need to be careful that conflicts of interest, as far as possible, are, are, do not become an issue, yeah. uh, because that in itself undermines confidence of the public and uh, leads to all kinds of speculation, real or imaginary. I, I should have said, of course, that Mr McCracken is chairman of two companies that supply uh, products to the electricity service. One of the companies owned by Mr Lawrence McKenzie, I believe, supplies transformers. Uh, the other one is Simple Power, which supplies electricity from windmills. So clearly, I believe I was entirely justified in raising questions about the potential conflict of interest. Just a conclusion, that has been removed now. That's the only interest I had in it. No interest in the personalities. Uh, no interest in uh, any watch hunt of anybody. And uh, I do think that Mr McCracken does deserve credit for having taken the decision to resign. Is that the same same boy? Uh, uh, with the simple power? Yes. OK, members. Um, Thank you, Deputy Chairperson, for that. Um, if no other comments, are we content to note the response and the correspondence? Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, members, for our next piece of business, John, are you content that that be dealt with and closed? I, I, I have taken the advice of the clerk, and whose wisdom I would never turn down, never refuse. But if anybody wishes to have it in public, I'm keen and eager that it should happen that way. But I have to reflect on what the advice has been given the clerk, and I have to reflect on the overall uh, needs of the committee. That represents a lot more than just me. So I'm happy we go on to committee, but uh, it wouldn't be my preferred. Thank you, Kieran. Do, do we need to deal with this in committee? Because are we not bringing forward information that's already out there? If, if there's new information, I would think that that's another issue. But we're dealing with already information which is in the public domain. Is yeah, there an assessor? Yeah, well, I may, maybe the clerk might want to have a few words on this, but there, there is some information that we don't have in front of us. Right. May well be, could well be discussed today. Right. We just don't have the, only, the, only, the only danger with that, sir, person given this is a public accounts committee. Mm -hmm. If we bring that in confidence, then I suppose we you, you, you could be forgiven for thinking that John was actually right in the first instance because we're actually trying to hide something now. Do you know what I mean, John? No, I, I mean, I, I know that the Assembly has been under scrutiny for having too many issues uh, in committee. But at the end of the day, I would still be influenced by the advice of the clerk who may well have taken legal advice, I don't know, I haven't asked him, but uh, I think maybe the best way to handle it is take it in committee and if Trevor or anybody feels that there's something that should be in public, I have no problems, absolutely not. So we, we, can, we can go into closed and then if you feel the need that you want to come out to make a comment then we can do that? I don't think I was ready to come out yet. Sorry? I don't think any of us would like to come out. <laughs> the committee room.